Hey, it's Anthony from Amplify Live. I hope you're having a good weekend so far. Just wanted to share a recording of a discussion I had in the Amplify Live community earlier this week, particularly focused on vaccines and the ongoing rollout program on a global level. Now, the reason why I wanted to share this is because it's such an important factor for what the rest of 2021 might look like. So having a bit more of a deeper understanding of the vaccines and how are things going and what are the things to look out for going forward is gonna be really important to understand markets in 2021. So if you have any questions, leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel on YouTube. I'd really appreciate it and enjoy the session. Okay, so it's Wednesday, 3rd of February. I'm here with Mike. Ivy, part of the Amplify Live community. So yeah, I mean, last week, there was a point last week where, I mean, I was getting fluttered with messages from lots of different people, market and non-market people asking me about GameStop and AMC and all these other things. And then there was news from, I remember from Novavax and then the J&J &J information. And I'm like, there's people dying <laughs> right yeah. now. You know, the, the fate of, the the economy which is a consequence people's jobs and livelihood um and we're talk we're sat here talking about reddit and i did find that a difficult pill to swallow but predominantly because i come as a macro person i guess uh, but ultimately i think we all kind of had the notion that this would be that would be a short-lived thing it creates a media response of course but ultimately for yeah. markets as you know the vaccine is the key almost for trying to pick our way through what the future might look like particularly 2021 so i know you've done some slides and let me okay. let me bring up let's call it exhibit a <laughs> so what do we have here brilliant so i'll i think we'll start we just talk about the uk and then we'll, 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 we'll broaden it out a bit but um uh so a couple of weeks ago um the scottish government published on its website its projections for vaccine supply um, and the UK government went slightly nuts as, as they saw it as being sort of uh, a strategic plan that they didn't want to reveal to anyone um, so the Scottish government actually backed down and usually offered a, an apology and took it off the website um, <coughs> Excuse me. And then actually last week, um, when relations weren't so good again, they were they, they were threatening to put the figures back up. Um, uh, partly, it was suggested to um, be helpful to the EU, um, partly to wind up the British government. Uh, now, whether that's still the plan, I'm not sure. But but anyway, the the point, the main point here is while these figures were up, um, we could actually see. Um, because the Scottish plan is is simply the UK plan, um, but just you know, at a smaller scale, we could actually see what the UK plan is for vaccine uh, distribution and vaccine supply. So you can see really that um, uh, very early on in January, uh, the UK is very, very dependent on the Pfizer vaccine, but going forward to June, which is where this, this ends, um, the, it's the AstraZeneca vaccine plays um, by far the biggest part in the UK vaccination program. Um, and then you can see in April, uh, there's a little bit of uh, Moderna vaccine coming through. But, but what's interesting about this is, is there's very, very little of it, and it's not really arriving till April. And this, this actually has um, implications for the EU as well, is, is that although both the UK and the EU have approved the Moderna vaccine, um, the US has really gobbled up all the supplies and okay. there's nothing really coming through until, um, as I say, we've got April. And even then, going through May, June, it's only a very, very small part of the UK vaccination plan. Yeah, so th th this was definitely something that um, I know that you've been talking about a lot, but I wanted people to be aware aware of was the composition of what different countries vaccine program looks like, because determining then the impact value of a headline 
Yeah. Like what we were seeing with this debacle with the Astra situation in Belgium and then how they were going to take a protectionist stance and start doing X, Y, Z from a European perspective, although that's kind of come and gone. It's important to understand then this type of level to pick through then if there is a particular um, away from the drug in itself and those previous discussions we've had on price and distribution, there's also the strategy and understanding that. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think um, just to uh, digress a little bit, um, I was talking to um, actually my brother-in-law who, who, who negotiates pharma contracts. And when the EU came out and said, well, um, uh, well, at first they said there, were, there, there was no um, what they call best endeavors clause in, in the AstraZeneca uh, contract. Um, it, that was never going to be the case. You know, the vast majority of pharma contracts have what they call best endeavor clauses. So um, the only way a pharma will enter into a contract with someone is by saying, well, we will do our very best. Otherwise, they, they were just, they're not interested. Um, so when von der Leyen said, well, there's no best endeavors clause, um, that in itself, that was very unlikely. And then when they published the actual uh, contract, it was in there. So she was, she was actually wrong about it. I don't know if she was, she didn't know or, or she, you know, it seemed a very strange thing to say um, because all farmers cover their cover their asses essentially with these clauses about best endeavors mm. um and then there was uh and, and the same thing with with pfizer remember it's not just astra who have said will there be a delay to vaccines going to the eu pfizer have said the same thing and moderna have said the same thing so they're all having different problems with ramping up their production but all of these companies will have these best endeavor uh clauses in their contracts and I see, you know, the Italians were thinking about taking Pfizer to court. And my view is, you know, the Pfizer lawyers will wipe the floor with them. And actually, I think von der Leyen has, has recently, I think yesterday, sort of walked back from this. So yeah. um, whether it's on legal advice or she's decided to become Macy of the pharma companies, I'm not sure. But I find that the prospect of, of the EU taking any of these companies to court yeah. is very, very remote. So, so a lot of this, to me, is coming from a political place where yeah. this is all just posturing they will know the legal stance of this and the likelihood of it being successful in court as you say is nil <laughs> so they, they will that's lose. not the point yes. though so they, i guess they're just saying it particularly coming from somewhere like italy i can almost yeah. imagine the types of italian politicians who would say that cajoling sentiment in a politically disruptive period it's a great target right to have another stab at your your potential leadership by saying it's them it's them point the finger yeah to therefore yeah. become more favorable so yeah I, that makes sense but yeah. i guess it's kind of um now we've moved on right so now so so what's 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 next should I, should okay I so if we go to the next slide um so what what we're able to do from the first slide, and this is what Sky, Sky did the analysis on this analysis of this uh, a couple of weeks ago, is taking the Scottish figures, we can work out what the UK figures are, and looking forward, um, using the actual numbers, um, so, so that graph is actually supplied with the exact numbers in a supporting document by, by the Scottish government, you can work out exactly when the UK government is planning to have the, the whole of the UK population, population vaccinated. And if you, if you add up all these numbers, you get to a, uh, a point in the middle of July when the government will have sufficient, UK government will have sufficient doses uh, for the entire UK adult population. That's, that's two doses. So, so if everything goes well, by the middle of July, either everyone will have been vaccinated or everyone will have been able to be vaccinated. Mm. Um, so, the, the, you know, the Scottish did, our, uh, did us all a favour because they sort of, they, they showed us the plan. <laughs> um, yeah. um, they also showed everybody else the plan, including the EU, yeah. um, who could see that um, there are all these Astra 
uh, uh, vaccine doses that they didn't have access to. Right. I think that's, that was part of the uh, part of the problem, really. Um, so, so first question on here is, let's say um, 105 million doses, entire UK adult population, mid July. Yeah. How, how does that sit for you in terms of a, a, a calendar timing in terms of its delivery? Is that good, bad, indifferent? How do you kind of see that? I mean, I, I can think of other quest, follow up questions on risks to obviously this projected trajectory. But first of all, mid July would, would be good. Yeah. Well, I think I think as uh, uh, I, th I think as a target, it's realistic. And I think um, they're on track. I mean, the, the we have we know that they want to do 15 million doses by the middle of February. That plan seems to be broadly on track. And I've no reason to bar sort of uh, supply interruptions. Mm. I've no reason to think why this isn't um, this isn't achievable. And I think that that's the other thing. I think I think the government was was nervous that the E would block block exports of the Pfizer vaccine when um, there are a lot of uh, UK pensioners, people over the age of eighty. So. The Pfizer vaccine in the UK went to the very most vulnerable at the beginning. Exactly as you're saying. Um, so they're, they're people over the age of 80. Um, and uh, there's certainly a thought that the UK government was worried that they would not be able to give the most vulnerable, i.e. The, the, the oldest over the age of 80 or 85, their second doses. But it seems that that's de-escalated and, mm. and the, the EQ, EU seem to be saying, yeah, you can have the Pfizer doses. The five, Pfizer doses, remember, are made in Belgium. Um, and the EU seems to be saying, no, you can have those doses, it's, it's fine. So that they have walked back from that. So, um, and there are, one of the reasons this is important is, is nobody really knows about the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine um, outside of its stated parameters. So we know that it works incredibly well if you give two doses three weeks apart. Mm. Nobody has a clue what happens if you just give one dose or if you give one dose 12 weeks apart. Okay. That's the risky bit of the UK strategy. And this was what we got a little bit of colour on because I was looking at last night, I just happened to be at my desk and I was looking at the Oxford Astra data as it was yeah. coming out, and it was giving exactly what you were just talking about there, the efficacy rates between week like three and 12, and then post 12 weeks on the second shot, efficacy rate went up. Yeah. Um, and then obviously legitimizing the UK's strategy on deploying first shot first, yeah. <laughs> as many as possible, and then top up. Well, I think, I think, yeah, so, so the point about this, um, they call it preprint. So the, the preprint data from AstraZeneca, which was in the Lancet, um, so it, it, it's subject to review, I think is the point um, mm -hmm. of, 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 that's what a preprint is. But, but what essentially they were doing was publishing the data from which the government had, had made its strategy. So obviously the government has seen this data and made its strategy on the basis of this data. So it doesn't so much support what the government is saying, the government was working from it when it made its strategies. So the government had right. all this information. Um, and actually, it seems to be a reasonably clever plan with regard to the AstraZeneca uh, uh, vaccine. And more generally, I think there seems to be evidence that the adenovirus vaccines, and I'm talking about Johnson & Johnson, uh, Sputnik, and um, AstraZeneca, there seems to be quite a lot of evidence that protection ramps up over time. Um, and it may be something to do with the fact that the, the vector, the delivery vector, in itself produces a, a, some sort of immune or T cell response. It's very difficult to be sure about that, but it's but it's certainly possible. And this is in a way that the, the um, mRNA vaccines perhaps don't because they're using a different mechanism. Um, but um, 
it's funny it's like the tur- the tortoise and the hare it was like it was so bullish on the first to market and this kind yeah. of the the moderna pfizer biontech and now kind of what you were saying i guess going all the way back to that session we did when you were talking about the list and everything that was in the pipeline and then the single dose j and j that could be an interesting one and that's only just come really yeah with information now some several months later it's interesting how um the, the, the kind of landscape's changed a little bit it has and i, th- I think the so the mrna vaccines have incredible um got upfront efficacy you know so they're 95 percent effective whereas the adenovirus one seems to be slightly less effective but but i think maybe maybe there's much more to it and i think you alluded to this uh, you've alluded to this several times that that it's just not the headline efficacy rate that matters and you need to look like at things like um uh, what happens if you only give a single dose uh, mm. what happens over a period of time and what happens with um, infection transmission rates and and i think the jury is still out on all of that and 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 we will really only know in you know six months or a year's time um which is the better approach so yeah there's still a lot to play for um one uh, qu- question then just quickly on this this, this graphic before we move yeah. on is how large is the risk of what a lot of the mainstream media is focused on at the moment, which is um, the, the kind of a mutation on a, the mutation. It's kind of like the new variant of the UK variant that was already different from the initial COVID breakout that we had back in March. So um, the, I think the UK government's response in my view has been, has been pretty quick to kind of um, ramp up testing in these specific areas which they've identified. But how much of a risk then is this whole idea, which has always been an ever-present key risk, which is the vaccine efficacy weakens? Because we've seen with some of the data that has come out, the vaccine has a different efficacy rate dependent on the South African variant, the UK variant, other variants. And that if it then further mutations happen with time, is that the key risk that could destabilize this this trajectory? No, I, I don't. I don't think it will destabilize the um, the rollout this year. So, so yeah, there are uh, some mutations which, and as you say, it, 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 one they're worried about now is is the sort of South African mutation of the Kent virus, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I, the thing about these vaccines is is they're doing they're doing a number of things. So so ideally, uh, first thing they're doing is stopping you getting the virus. The second thing they're doing is stopping you getting ill. Then they're stopping you getting hospitalised, and then they're stopping you dying. Yeah. And um, the current crop of vaccines will we'll do with the, with the muta- mutations that are around they will probably do most of what's required, which is stopping you getting really ill, stopping you getting hospitalized, and stopping you getting dying. Mm. So, so that's actually, in a sense, um, the most important thing. Right. That was so exactly- may, It may be more likely yeah. that you actually get the virus, but it's probably still quite unlikely that you'll become ill or seriously ill. Yeah, and that was a really key thing that I saw when the J&J numbers were snapped last week which is that when it came to the latter part of that kind of process, as you described, which is serious illness in hospital and death, yeah. it was basically 100% effective. Yeah. And, well, and- all, of the, all of the viruses to date, so that, I think we've got six, six people looking at six of these. So if you took, um, you took the, te- the two mRNA vaccines, the Novavax vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Johnson Johnson vaccine and Sputnik, there are no instances of deaths in hospitals or admission to ICU units or serious illness in hospital. So they, across the board, they're 100% effective in that regard. And you, you could say, well, that's that's job done. You know, if these, these viruses are 100% effective in, um, 
in making stopping people from getting seriously ill and ending up in the ICU and then dying, they're, they're, they're incredibly effective. Mm. So, so I think we're not at the point yet, but we, we'll come on to it a bit later about some boosters and things. Um, but I don't think I don't think the government's vaccination strategy is at risk, uh, probably this year from from these mutations. So, so it's an important thing bringing this into an intraday environment just to kind of really hit home that point um, from what you've discussed and then the way that the news came out. And that's a function, I think, of news agencies. They're always going to snap the what is deemed as kind of like your headline changing non-farm payroll figure, yeah, which is the overall efficacy rate, which isn't necessarily the be all and end all. Uh, and what was so interesting about that move last week and what I really want people to be careful of is the immediate knee-jerk reaction that you see in the, in the immediate aftermath of that headline hitting the tape to then the rational response, if you yeah. want to call it that, which is the more, as we've just described, which is looking through the numbers and, and eventually that move was very short-lived. So, yeah. okay, so should we move on to... So let's move on. Okay. So I think I think just briefly we'll we're, we're, we're um, just look at the the UK sort of portfolio of like so these are the drugs on order you can see again the Astra the Oxford Astra is is a big number of doses and the point the major upside for this vaccine is it's made in it's manufactured in in, in two plants in the UK and it's bottled um, in a plant in Wales so it's largely UK based for both production and distribution. So you're not, um, uh, you shouldn't really have problems with, with, with supply chains. And they seem to be getting better at making it and, and, and getting faster. So, so, so that's incredibly good news. And, and obviously the data, the new data around the vaccine is incredibly promising as well. So that's good news. The Janssen is, is the, the Johnson Johnson um, vaccine, which they've got uh, the UK government sold 30 million. The, the, the downside um, with the Janssen J, J is, again, there's a production delay uh, and um, they're two months behind where they wanted to. And I, th I think that the supplies to Europe will probably not really start to happen till April, maybe March, but April. And it will only be to begin with in, in fairly small quantities. So whether in Q1, Johnson Johnson will make no difference to the UK, possibly not even Q2. Um, so it's a sort of mid-year, end-of-year event, really. Um, and uh, so, so they've got these doses. How they'll use them isn't clear to me if, if by the middle of July the population is ready to be vaccinated. So we just have to... Uh, <laughs> we, we, we'll see. So that's what... I saw. I guess it's a insurance policy. Yeah, with a exactly. cost, obviously, but I guess it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, me. and, and I, th I think there is. You can argue that actually the acquisition strategy has been incredibly clever, which is investing in all of these different vaccines using a sort of private equity model. One or two of them will come good. <laughs> right. Yep. And one or two of them you're probably not going to end up using, and 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 actually that's a fair enough way to do it, I think. Um, so it's expensive. I think they spent what was it, twelve billion pounds on vaccines or something like that. It's expensive, but but yep. but if it's the only way to rescue your economy, it's probably yep. good value. Mm -hmm. um, so just going down this, so they've ordered forty million Pfizer vaccines. Again, there is there is a production delay with Pfizer because they're redoing their their Belgian factory. So when these feed through is not clear to me now. Moderna. They've ordered 17 million. Um, again, most of the Moderna supply minute is going to the US. And we saw in the, in the, um, the vaccine acquisition strategy that you know, th this doesn't start to trickle through till, till April, May anyway, in only small quantities. So um, Moderna have, have big manufacturing problems because they've never done it before. So they're saying there are delays as well. So on top of the the vaccine strategy that the UK government has, they, you probably actually have to factor in more delays there um, on the back of what Moderna was saying last week. 
Um, moving down, the Sanofi vaccine is delayed, I think by six months. So um, I don't think we're gonna see that this year. Uh, Novavax will see Q3 probably, and Valneva, I'm not sure. They've ordered, interestingly, so Valneva is a sort of, is it Aus Austrian French company? I forget, but um, so they've got a production plant now in Scotland. Um, and the government's just ordered, the UK government's just ordered now another 40 million doses. So they've got sort of like 100 million doses on order of this vaccine, uh, which hasn't been approved. And I'm not quite sure again what they'll use it for, um, mm -hmm. because by the time it turns up, everyone should have been vaccinated. But anyway, we'll, we'll see whether it then becomes something to export. I, I, it's not clear to me, but they're well covered. So in terms of doses, they're well covered. But it's the Oxford vaccine, it's the one that's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of the initial vaccination strategy going up to July. I'm just thinking that probably the, um, I'm sure there's some association then with the fact that it's up in Scotland. With it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah, there's yes, a little bit of yeah. uh, political backdrop to that i'm sure but, yeah um, i think that's right um okay, okay so we, we 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 have slightly covered this but but um the the preprint as we said of the astrazeneca uh, data yesterday um sort of underlines the government's case that the 12 weeks or more is actually the i the ideal um timeline uh the the the, the the ideal um, space between two doses. So, so yes, 82.4% efficacy with 12 or more weeks between the doses. Um, interestingly, the 76% the efficacy after a single dose is quite interesting because I, you know, what's been crossing my mind is, is actually, because this is a similar vaccine to the J and J, is, is whether really, you know, you, you could mark it either as a single dose vaccine, or if the right. J and J, and I, they're doing trials this currently as a two dose vaccine, mm. um, you you could, you, you probably get a 90% or an 80% efficacy with it as a two dose vaccine. Whether, whether actually they're the same thing, you know, yeah, whether yeah. You a bit of the Astra is a single dose <laughs> and the J and J is a double dose, you know, um, mm. and same with, that, same with Sputnik actually, because these, these vaccines seem to be so similar. Um, so be interesting to see how that, that sort of pans out, really. Um, but it's good news, certainly good news, that you get this very, very high degree of efficacy after a, uh, <clears throat> after a single dose. And the government strategy of, of seems to be well thought out about being able to leave it for three months. Um, getting back to the Pfizer vaccine, where there's no data to support this gap between vaccination, um, a lot of the doctors in the UK have actually, my understanding, have actually been ignoring the government's advice and been giving um, patients the second dose of Pfizer vaccine three weeks after the first. I mean, my mother, who is um, 87, has had her two Pfizer doses three weeks apart because mm. her GP said, well, no, the government's talking nonsense. You've got to have <laughs> so everyone in her, her her sort of area, who is her age, have had their two yeah. doses of Pfizer. Um, and I, and I th I th it'd be interesting to see if the, if the government rose back from, on the Pfizer front. There's just no data to support it as a dosing strategy. There is, you know, we have the data on AstraZeneca and it seems to be very clever. Pfizer, I'm not so sure. So, so we will see if there are any changes to that. So with the, with the US, being Moderna Pfizer focused. Yeah. Not that we're going to delve into that too much. What was their thinking there? Was it a reflection of a fairly uh, lack of th thought behind the strategy given Trump was distracted by other things like holding, trying to win a second term? And obviously the program felt a bit piecemeal on how it was being put together. Um, and, and was it more for Trump about politically being able to publicly say 
you know, we've got the first vaccines. He was going for a different type of strategy. The underlying deployment and program rollout was secondary to the political payoff of being able to stand there and say, we've got the world's first vaccines. We're going to get it first. We're going to deploy them first. And so they've kind of, they're stuck in this. They've, they've preloaded now themselves down the Moderna Pfizer route. Um, did, did you see any like that? Yeah, I don't think... Um... I mean, the, the US is, is in a, uh, has had a lot of problem from the, the sort of distribution perspective. Um, and the whole thing seems to have been done absolutely chaotically, but, but now seems to be sort of gradually getting together. In terms of the choice of vaccines, I, I mean, they're both, you know, the Moderna and the um, Pfizer vaccines are, are excellent vaccines. The production is, is sort of, uh, is, is domestic so that makes mm. things easier yeah there's this freezer problem but a first world country should be able to to get around that i i, I don't know I, I was wondering if at some point they had a falling out with with astrazeneca because i think trump trump was incredibly keen to have a vaccine as we know approved mm. before the election yeah um and there was some talk that he wanted to lean on AstraZeneca to sort of come up with data, which would enable him to do this. And uh, there was some talk at the time that they refused to do so. And I wonder at that point whether they then went to the back of the queue. Um, mm. So I'm not absolutely sure about that, mm. but it's certainly at one point Trump was cheerleading for AstraZeneca and then that all stopped mm. but it, it, it does actually make sense for the US to go for these vaccines because well they can afford them these are obviously expensive vaccines the uh, Pfizer and Moderna um, they've got the infrastructure and um, they've got the production facilities so it's not it's not a bad strategy it's it's been cocked up on the distribution side not the acquisition side Cool. So should we move on to what the EU is looking like? Yeah, so this is where it gets uh, <coughs> uh, messy, shall we say. So uh, this is from the EU website. Um, the Commission has secured 2.3 billion doses. Well, let's take Pfizer. So up to 600 million doses. Well, at the minute, this, this is completely delayed because the majority of the, of the EU vaccines are made in this one plant in Belgium. The plant is being upgraded, so supplies have ground to a halt. Also, <clears throat> they've actually got um, an initial order of 300 million doses. And I think recently they, they said, well, we want another 300, but that will be uh, a Q3 or even a Q4 event. So it's gonna come so late mm. that it's not, possibly going to affect um their, it's not going to be able to impact on their immediate needs so so 600 million doses okay but you're not getting any at the minute because the factory is not working and a lot of that you're not going to get until the end of the year um because that's the only time that, that pfizer can supply them moderna up to 160 million doses well again the us is getting all of that supply at the minute um, and uh, that won't start to trickle through to the EU, I think, till, till spring, summer. Uh, Sanofi G GSK is up to 300 million deals. That's delayed by six months. That's not happening anytime soon. Johnson & Johnson delayed by two months. Um, so they're not going to get these, uh, any Johnson & Johnson, I think, till, uh, I think von der Leyen said it would start in April, but I think yeah. they'll get very, very few doses in April. Why J and J ramps up. So again, this is this is moving to back into Q2, Q3, Q4. CureVac hasn't been approved yet, I think. Yeah. And AstraZeneca, well, we know about AstraZeneca. So 2.3 billion doses, but none anytime soon. <laughs> and actually, when you see it broken down like this, it's quite easy to see then that the that Europe doesn't have anywhere to go when no. it comes to playing games with any distribution of drugs into the UK then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, 
yeah, it's not a, it's not a great picture. And and the point about the Astra, I mean, the Astra, the whole Astra story is very unfortunate. And um, the point should be made that actually the UK production was delayed for two, by two or three months while they were sorting out the production here. So the UK government was expected expecting, I think, to have 20 million doses by Christmas, and it had 1 million or something because of the production delays. So it's not just the EU that's been affected by Astra production delays. Um, you know, it's just not easy to do this. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, so I think the next couple of months are gonna be very awkward for, for the EU because there's just not going to be a lot of vaccine coming through. That's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, when, when the, when we had the original spring 2020 outbreak, it was, you know, I remember France being very quick to adopt a fairly stringent lockdown. Yeah. And obviously at that, at that point, Boris was either, I can't remember, was he on holiday in Mauritius or was he, um, <laughs> he was uh, shaking everyone's hand, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll squash the sombrero. Yeah. We're still being caught. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but it's amazing how that's flipped really. And um, I don't yes. know whether it's just been, fortunate or a lack of um you know there's, there's lots of variables obviously to input how complicated this rollout is but it's amazing how the tables have turned from the beginning to to where we're at right yeah, now okay. and i think politically yeah, boris johnson has always been very lucky i mean he's a lucky <laughs> lucky politician and you know in a year's time it is entirely conceivable to me that people would have forgotten about the horrendous number of deaths and they'll be talking about a successful vaccine strategy. Mm. Um, and it will all be sort of forgotten. You know, this, 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 the deaths in the care homes and you know, the mm. utter catastrophe of some of the government policy making mm. um, because they got the vaccine done. And, and to be fair, it, is, it's, it, it, it will not have been an inconsiderable achievement if they do it. So, you know, you, but, but, but we'll see. We'll yeah. see. But so far, so good. So the final bit. Okay, so, yeah. so then, yeah. So one of the things that, you know, we were talking about last time and it's still my view is it's not clear to me that any of the uh, vaccine manufacturers are going to make any money out of this. Um, um, so if you take Pfizer results yesterday, they were saying, well, you know, our vaccine with the, so they've increased the numbers this year that they can produce from 1.3 billion to 2 billion. And they say, well, it will, it will add 10 cents to our EPS this year, which really isn't for a company the size of Pfizer, you know, it's, it's just nothing. And I, I think the shares fell yesterday by 2% following the, uh, following the earnings. So, uh, you know, and obviously Pfizer, one of the, the one of the more successful uh, people at getting their vaccine approved and manufactured and then distributed. So, you know, Astra aren't going to make any money out of it. j, &J is a huge company. I just, you know, it just, the vaccine just won't move the needle in terms of their, their earnings. Um, Moderna have production problems, uh, potentially because their vaccine is expensive, they might earn some money, but, but as an investor, you look at the valuation of Moderna and it's $40 billion or something. They're a company with one product and yeah. they have a technology mRNA, which they don't own. So, you know, Astro are working on mRNA vaccines. Jackson Smith Klein are working on mRNA vaccines. You know, it's not unique to uh, Moderna. Um, so it's not clear to me where they go next, how you can justify are they going to make $40 billion out of this vaccine? No, they're not. Um, how do you get to that valuation? And I think it's pretty tricky. Same with uh, BioNTech. There's a massive uh, valuation now. And you just think as an investor, well, I'm, I'm not going to touch at that valuation. So the small, in my view, the small farmers making vaccines are overvalued. And the large farmers, um, the vaccine doesn't make enough, doesn't make enough big enough difference to to them to alter the to alter their valuation. So yeah. um, so which brings us on to well, how might uh, the pharma companies make some money? And I think what we're moving to now is it's very clear 
because of these mutations, that there are going to have to be boosters. And we know that they're all now working on boosters. Um, just go back a second. The other, the other thing, looking at the UK vaccine orders, several people have made the observation that towards the end of the year, there's going to be a vaccine glut. There are going to be so many vaccines circulating in the West that there's, you know, everybody could have five doses. You know, so, so a lot of these things won't be distributed, won't be sold because we won't need them. So that's another reason why farmers may not make the money that they think they're going to make because they have an unsold vaccine. Um, so, so what are they thinking about? Farmers are now thinking about, right, well, let's try and make some money out of boosters. Um, and <clears throat> what is then interesting to think about well, is, is what does an ideal booster look like? And the bottom line here is, is the person who gets this right might be the farmer that gets this right, might be the farmer that, that cleans up. Um, and actually does actually make some money out of, you know, every year from their booster shop. But mm -hmm. it's going to have to be cheap, you know, maybe $5. Ideally, it's going to be a single dose. Ideally, it's going to ship and store at room temperature um, for ease of distribution. Obviously, very few side effects and as close as possible to being 100% effective. Pfizer, Moderna, Novavax, Astra are all currently working on on these boosters. And it'd be interesting, I have no idea who will get it right, but whoever gets closest to this sort of mix of um, uh, ideal, uh, this ideal scenario must have a good chance of selling uh, an awful lot of them. Um, there are, one thing to think about <coughs> is, the UK already has an ideal distribution mechanism for boosters because it does it every year with the flu vaccine. So last October, November, I think something like 30 million people in the UK uh, got flu vaccines at the, either their pharmacy or their GP. And um, it costs the government 10 pounds. So the, the actual vaccine is about four pounds and then they pay uh, the pharmacist or the GP five or six pounds to administer the dose. So it works brilliantly. Quite why they didn't do this in the first place with, with the vaccines, I'm not sure. Why we need these big vaccination centers when as a model, pharmacists and GPs works incredibly well, I don't know, but anyway. But I think going forward, that, that would be the way to do it, is you're using the, the pharmacists and the, um, the GPs to give these booster shots. And the ideal way of doing this is you have a combined flu and um, coronavirus shot, which is perfectly feasible technically. So both Novavax and Moderna are working on a joint COVID flu shot. And it makes sense. So every year when you go for your flu vaccine in the test tube are these two, these, these two well, in the syringe rather, these two vaccines, flu and, and COVID. And it could be that that's, that's what happens. And if, if one of these farmers comes up with a cheap joint flu and COVID shot, they should clean up. 